So it goes without saying that data is fundamentally changing the way we see and engage with the world. Over the past year, especially, data has become a daily fixture in public communication, driving everything from personal decision making to public policy. And visualization provides everyone from scientists to humanists to everyday people with a means for readily exploring information using our sense of sight and our intuitions. So what my research explores is how we can leverage the brain's ability to make sense of visual information to design novel visualization tools for interactive exploratory data analysis. You can see a subset of these projects here and with a fantastic team of students and collaborators, we work with stakeholders to help analysts in domains ranging from literary scholarship, to biology, to emergency response, to make sense of their data, and to guide more effective and efficient decision making and data exploration. So when we think about data science, one of the first things that comes to mind is this idea of big data. But we're also seeing challenges in terms of new users, new data variety and complexity, and new questions that people want to tackle with that data. More and more people are looking to leverage data to the point where graphs and charts have become a common fixture on the evening news. And more of these folks are approaching data without formal training in analytics. Further, we're developing techniques to bring data together from different sources to enrich our perspectives and applications ranging from social media analysis to personalized medicine. And in bringing new people and new data forward, we're also raising new questions to be asked of that data. Now, many of you might be sitting there thinking, so what? Why can't we just compute the right answer and not worry about any of these problems? Well, we've seen unprecedented advances in machine learning that offer us really powerful computational tools. I don't wanna sell that short, but I also wanna argue that we still need to bring people into exploratory analysis. We don't always know what we're looking for and statistics, while incredibly powerful, don't always give us the information that we need. So let me illustrate this with a quick example. Here are four first order statistics for four different data sets. Would you say these four distributions are pretty similar? Many of you have probably guessed that I'm messing with you a little bit here. So all of these data sets have the same first order statistics, but when I visualize the data sets, they have qualitatively very different structures. And we can see that immediately here. We have linear trends, constants with outliers, and parabolic structures. We have words to describe how this data behaves, and we qualitatively understand the differences, even if we can't readily enumerate them. But what's happening here? How do we build knowledge from data using visualizations that we can't with statistics? So I'm gonna focus on just these two scatter plots to try to explain this. The process of interpreting data happens over time. It starts with our sense of sight. Essentially light from the red and the orange points goes into the eye, fires off a set of signals to start the process of interpreting information. And at the end of this process, we reach the far side of the spectrum, insights, the knowledge that we generate using visualizations, for example, one insight we might infer from this data is while these data sets have identical statistics, they have qualitatively different shapes that we can describe as either linear or parabolic. But how do we get from our sense of sight to insight from structures and patterns to knowledge? What is going on in between? Well, I wanna argue that by understanding the perceptual and cognitive processes between sight and insight, we can start to understand how the ways we visualize data determine the knowledge that people can infer from that data. And my work models how people generate knowledge from visualization and uses these models to create new tools and techniques for analyzing data. To give you the high level overview of our research process, we generally achieve these ideas in three phases. The first involves discussions with domain experts to identify what the problem they're trying to solve is, and what the current limitations are in their existing approaches. We then conduct empirical studies to model how we can optimize our representations based on needs and context of the analysis problem. And we use this data to drive new algorithms for supporting interactive data exploration and embody these models and approaches in interactive exploratory analysis systems, where we develop analysis tools and work with stakeholders to iterate on those tools and optimize for their particular sets of needs. 
So we've used this process to create new models, guidelines, algorithms, and systems across a broad range of applications. You can see uh, the list of broader areas that we're currently working on in the lab here. I'm happy to, to jump in in individual conversations and talk about any of these areas or other future areas that might be fun opportunities for us all to collaborate. But for today, I really want to focus on three specific problem areas that illustrate this process. Um, so these areas, the first of these areas is automating effective visualization design. And this is a problem that pervades across domains, and it's where I'll spend most of my time today. The second of these investigates the cognitive barriers that current visualization practices create, trying to figure out how we can make data more accessible for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities in the context of fiscal self-advocacy. And the last thread that I'll talk about explores how augmented reality, mobile data, cloud computing, and immersive analytics all come together to support situated data analysis in field operations in earth science and emergency response. So to get started, designing effective viz is just flat out a challenging problem. Something as simple as choosing the right colors requires understanding how people perceive color, how the semantics of color align with data, how the relationships between colors highlight key patterns, and if that wasn't already enough, choosing colors that actually look good together. And this is an important challenge as color is among the most common methods for encoding data. It's first off pretty, and our brains are actually really, really good at synthesizing it. So in my dissertation work, I constructed several systems for applications in biology that showed how color usages can increase scalability by tenfold or more. However, we see color used in all kinds of visualizations, from scatter plots to surfaces to maps and beyond. But as I mentioned, color is really hard to do right. Poorly designed color encodings may not just look bad, but can lead to misinterpretation and have even caused papers to be withdrawn from top journals like Nature and Science. Work with doctors done by Michelle Borkin and her colleagues showed that effective color choices can actually improve diagnosis rates by 30% or more. So choosing good colors can actually become a matter of life and death. Two of the biggest things that make color encodings hard are that we don't have good models for mapping uh, color differences to data differences. And even with the models that we do have, using color well currently requires substantial design expertise. So in collaboration with my students, as well as folks at Tableau, IUPUI, and LANL, what I've looked to do is figure out how can we better model and understand what it means to use color well in order to drive algorithmic solutions that help people use color more effectively. So a lot of my work in this space fits into two primary threads. How do people see colors in Viz? And how do we design algorithms that help people use color more effectively? A lot of this has been very methodological, focusing on how we can model the ways people perceive colors directly as a function of the design components of a visualization. So what these techniques aim to do is let us use experimental data to probabilistically model how precisely people can discern color differences across a wide range of visualization designs. And once we figured out how people see differences in color, we can look more globally, developing metrics and algorithms for choosing sets of color that effectively communicate properties of our data. For today, I'll focus more on the algorithmic side of this work, uh, specifically exploring how we can use data mining practices to automatically bootstrap color encoding design. So to set the stage for a lot of this work, the Viz community has historically used the CIE lab color space rather than RGB as a way to map color to data. Lab consists of three axes that essentially mimic the cells in the eye, and we can use lab for viz as unlike RGB, it's what we call approximately perceptually linear. That is one unit of Euclidean distance approximately corresponds to one 50% just noticeable difference for J and D, which is the smallest difference that people can reliably distinguish at a rate greater than chance. So CIA Lab gives us this really nice one-to-one -one mapping between data and color differences that's critical for data analysis and that in practice fails absolutely miserably. So let me show you how. CIA Lab states that we should be able to see seven different colors in this bar chart. No need to adjust your monitor. As you can probably see, this expectation just simply doesn't pan out. So this designers have hand-tuned color sets for data representation using decades of experience to employ these models as heuristics in crafting better encodings 
by essentially just using well-defined and well-developed intuitions. However, even these encodings can start to break down as we change the size of our marks, or even as we change the kinds of visualizations that we're using. And in encodings, we want to figure out how do we balance discriminability, the ability to preserve important data differences, with the range of desired data differences we need to encode based on the data sets that we have. So to achieve this goal, we created a data-driven method to proactively anticipate how color difference perceptions change as a function of the visualizations that we use. That is, we wanted to create models that allow us to match the differences we see in colors to the differences that exist in our data. We developed three different models using this approach, the first focusing on what we call diagonally symmetric marks, like points in a scanner plot, the second on elongated marks, like bars in a bar chart, and the third on asymmetric elongated marks, like lines in a line graph. In total, we collected over 34,000 data points to see these models across a range of crowd reviewers. For the sake of time, I'm going to skip the nitty gritty of these methods. I'm more than happy to chat about the details of these experiments online, or you can check them out in the paper but I do wanna to touch on what it is that we found. So our studies show that our ability to perceive differences in data encoded by color vary according to the design of our visualization. And in particular, these abilities vary systematically by mark size and shape with our abilities to discern color differences improving both as data set points get larger and as they get longer. So we found that the gains with respect to elongation are asymptotic, but could be quite dramatic. So our vis dependent models predict that we lose about 70% of the data differences predicted by CIE lab in practice. But when we consider the geometries of a data point, we can actually buy back about 30% of that difference, meaning we can resolve differences a lot more reliably if we choose colors that are tailored to our visualization design. And the other cool bit with these results is just how cleanly we can make these predictions. We actually were able to compute normalizing constants using a range of allowable mark sizes that feed into our Euclidean distance formulation in order to predict with a surprisingly high degree of precision how well people could actually discern color-coded data in VITS. So one of the ways that we might use these models is to evaluate our own practices and understand where current approaches may fall short. So you'll recall that designers often will hand adjust for the shortcomings of the CIE lab. And most color in Viz comes from a tool called Color Brewer. Ramps and Color Brewer are hand designed, typically considered the gold standard set of encodings available for people to use. So we can use our computational models to predict the effectiveness of existing encodings based on known minimum parameters of a Viz. For example, imagine that we have scatter plots with 10 pixel wide points and line graphs with four pixel thick lines. These roughly correspond to the standards that we see in Tableau on a 15 inch laptop. So we can use our models to anticipate which of our nine step Brewer sequential encodings that, designer, that were designed for use in cartography will be robust to these scatter plots and line graphs. That is, which will allow us to distinguish between each of our nine steps and which are likely to create ambiguities in our data. Using our models, we actually found that 13 of the 18 color brewery encodings actually failed to preserve sufficient color differences for these visualizations. And so this failure of these ramps suggests the need to consider mark aware models and encoding design. We're actually losing much of the fidelity that we assume even in expert crafted designs due to assumptions about fixed discriminability embedded in conventional models. So this kind of creates a big problem. It suggests that we need to rethink the ways that we craft ramps. So as we saw earlier, designers have a fine-tuned sense of how to build good color encodings, but even they don't have it perfectly correct yet. However, it's really hard for the vast majority of us to generate colors with high perceptual and aesthetic quality. It's just hard to do well, and it's also incredibly time-consuming. So what's the average visualization developer to do? Or to put this more simply, how do we choose the right colors for our data, especially as data grows in both size and complexity? Well, one approach we can use is to apply our models to proactively fix encoding challenges to encourage effective visualizations, support experimentation, and even conduct post hoc correction. So for example, if we design a scatter plot like we see here, we like our color choices, we may actually lose important differences in the data as our points shrink due to factors like added data or smaller displays. 
We can use our models to anticipate when this will happen, push apart the ANS for encoding, and then reinterpolate the encoding to preserve uniformity. Similarly, if our visualizations change, we can use our metrics to pull colors closer together to make better use of the available encoding space and allow more room for aesthetic choice. So this approach is great if you have a solid baseline. Selecting from a set of predefined tools might also lead to a little bit of deja vu. As you can see in this set of visits from the 2018 proceedings of the visual analytics track at the top viz conference, we use color a lot and maybe rely a bit more heavily than we realize on can ramps like those created by Color Brewer. In fact, in just a brief survey of that track, we found 25% of papers from that proceeding contained at least one viz with a red blue ramp. So essentially this is causing your visualization to blend in with the crowd. Even if you're okay with your viz not standing out, there are situations where we may need unique colors. For example, if we're working on branded presentations, we may need to use the colors associated with that brand. But there's not exactly a ton of demand out there for a lift pink ramp. Well, so what are we to do? Well, this leads us to the challenge we've tackled in this work, which is how do we enable people to create effective custom color ramps? To solve this, we developed a simple algorithm that lets you create high quality um, ramps using just a single guiding color. So in this case, let's use sky blue. Well, we can accomplish this by computing characteristic structures in designer ramps interpolated in a perceptual color space. We can then apply those ramps to a given color to generate a set of color ramps with different visual characteristics that developers can select from and refine. So most color ramp design methods lie along a spectrum from tools that offer pre-designed palettes like Color Brewer to those that allow full control to the user like Photoshop. So selecting from a set of can ramps is great if one of the handful of ramps that you can choose from meets your needs exactly, but you have no means for adjusting them. What you see really is what you get. On the other hand, tools like Color Picker for Data, seen here on the right, provide a lot more agency to the user. You can choose two endpoints in a perceptual space and interpolate those endpoints at equal intervals, but you have no guidance for choosing those colors. And this all gets to the interesting and nuanced recommendations we have for building effective color ramps. So what I have listed out here is a set of 17 best practices from a recent survey exploring decades of color use in Viz. However, color ramp design is really hard. It combines aspects of perception and aesthetics in ways that have to play nice with each other. And many of these concepts are heuristics that require substantial design expertise to apply effectively. So I'm gonna remove all the guidelines that fall into this heuristic category and leave only the concrete mathematical guidelines. Now that I have these, I'm going to remove those that are really hard to implement to design time without substantial color science expertise. And here's our results. So hopefully you're seeing now why creating ramps is pretty hard. And even if you have the expertise to follow many of these practices, we've actually found that in practice, designers don't typically follow many of these rules. So what are we gonna do? Well. We turned instead to a concept called design mining, which is an approach that uses data mining to model and reproduce design practices. And we use this design mining approach to capture the properties of effective color use in visualization. Our algorithm relies on the fundamental observation that ramps are essentially just curves constructed and interpolated in a 3D space. So we assert that the structure of the curve controls the aesthetic appearance of a ramp, and the ways that we sample the curve control the perceptual properties of the ramp. These curves could traverse a 3D CIA lab volume, but that gets a little mind bendy when you're trying to look at these volumes on a 2D display. So I'm gonna just show these as a series of projected 2D curves, one in hue space on the left and one in lightness and chroma on the right. So our algorithm consists of six steps roughly categorized into three phases. The first two steps create a uniform training corpus we use to derive our models. The second two cluster the curves based on their structural properties and compute characteristic structures describing each cluster. And the final pair takes these clusters from an abstract space and anchors them in color space to generate our encodings. And I'll walk through each of these at a high level here, but as always, happy to dive into more detail after the talk. 
So we started with a corpus of 222 handcrafted color ramps from known sources in the community, including color lovers, tableau, R, and color brewer. And we use this corpus as the training set for our model. We normalize each of these ramps by treating the colors in the ramp as control points and fitting interpolating B splines to these points. Once we had our splines constructed, we used arc length interpolation to resample the curves to a uniform number of points along roughly equidistant intervals in CIE lab. We clustered the normalized curves according to their physical structures. Again, more details about this mathematically are in the paper, but I want to show you a little bit of the results. So here, the 2D projected plots of these curves are shown in gray. And the basic idea is that we can align these curves by moving, rotating, and reflecting them to minimize the overall distance between control points. We then use either a K-means clustering based on structural features of each curve or a Bayesian clustering algorithm applied to an elastic shape descriptor to group curves sharing similar structures. Once we've done this grouping, we can compute a characteristic curve for each cluster by identifying the mean structure from our set of curves. And as you can see here in these projected plots, most of these curves are far from the linear and uniform structures that are recommended by design heuristics or design tools like Color Picker for Data, where we're doing just this linear interpolation in a perceptual color space. Instead, they kind of wiggle all over the place in interesting ways that create subtle but would turn out to be critical affective shifts. So once we have our characteristic curve, we can apply that curve to generate a ramp by adjusting the curve according to the relative lightness distribution. Basically, we start with the curve positioned according to the mean lightness model, and we then find a point in the curve that is closest to our desired color. Once we found this point, we shift the ramp such that we minimize the lightness variation from our original model, and then we anchor the resulting ramp in color space to get our new color ramp. We tested this approach in three ways, including a direct replication of existing designer practices and stress testing with poor color choices. And we also conducted a formal study with professional de designers to evaluate the perceptual and aesthetic characteristics of our ramp. So details about the first two evaluation methods are in the paper. And for the sake of time, I'm just going to touch briefly on our experimental evaluation. So in this evaluation, we pseudo-randomly seeded 25 ramps using models generated from the two different clustering algorithms and compared these with two baseline approaches. So our generated curves are shown here on the right, and we compared these with first a linear baseline where we linearly interpolated between two colors at least 40 units of lightness apart selected from our designer corpus. And then we used a designer baseline where we chose 25 ramps directly from our designer corpus at random. So this baseline gives us a theoretical threshold for what a high quality color encoding should look like. And we use these ramps in a series of visualizations where participants completed a target identification task, finding the point in the ramp closest to a given value to test the perceptual discriminability of each ramp. We paired these stimuli with an aesthetic question simply asking people to select how pleasant they found the colors in the viz to be. So we conducted the study with three different visualization types, scatter plots, heat maps, and choropleth maps. We recruited 35 designers from around the world to complete the study, and our designers had an average of 6.2 years of self-reported professional design experience. Cutting to the chase here, we can actually categorize these results according to both our perceptual, so kind of the how good is this ramp for a typical visualization task, and aesthetic measures. So in these graphs, you'll see our approach in green and the baselines in blue. So for our perceptual measures, we found that participants were actually more accurate with our approach than with linear ramps and tended towards being more accurate with our approach than with designers ramp, designer ramps. So I should note that that was a trending towards, it was not statistically significant. We found the same pattern with aesthetics. Participants tended to prefer our approach to linearly interpolated ranch and found our models at least as aesthetically pleasing as designer ramps. So the main takeaway here is that for these visualizations, we find that an expert participant pool found ramps generated using our approach comparable to those handcrafted by designers. 
Well, to make these results a little more actionable, we embedded our models in a color encoding design tool called Color Crafter that essentially provides a front end for this algorithm. The tool allows people to specify target colors to generate a set of ramps. They can manipulate those ramps using a sequence of affine transformations, including translation, rotation, scaling, and reflection along all the various axes of color space. The transformation-based edits allow users to quickly customize their encodings without sacrificing the quality of the resulting ramp. And through this approach, even novice visualization designers and developers can rapidly create custom color ramps that embody best practices in visualization design, and it only really requires them to specify one single guiding color. So you can see an example of some of the results of this approach here. For fun, I seeded a, a set of ramps using Carolina Blue, and you can see the results by inputting the target color into the tool. We're actually able to generate a series of color encodings to choose from that all adhere to our designer properties, all include our target color, but have slightly different affects and slightly different aesthetic quality. So, as promised, I want to briefly revisit how this work embodies my research approach. Uh, we started by characterizing the problem of why it's hard to choose good colors for this, showing that it's a complex, multi-dimensional space and considerations. From there, we developed probabilistic models to help people perceive colors in viz. Um, and we use these models to seed an algorithm and corresponding tool to bootstrap encoding design. So the end result of this process is fundamental knowledge of how vizs work, models that allow us to make them better, and tools that make it easier for people to create good visualizations. And as I mentioned, I want to toss out a little discussion of some of our ongoing work in case folks are interested in following up about potential collaboration. And one challenge that's come up in discussions with geologists and other in the earth sciences is how drastically different color maps can change the kinds of structures they see in their data. So we're currently exploring how we can interactively infer the parameters of ideal encoding choice by mining user preferences between color map designs applied to a scientist's own data using Bayesian optimization. We're also exploring alternative methods for using statistical models of viz viewed in automated settings. So under um, some of the work that's been recently funded as part of my career, we're starting to investigate how we can use statistical models of viz uh, statistical models of viz interpretation across a range of designs to try to automate the process of estimating how well a given viz will communicate a specific set of patterns. And the aim here is providing intelligent design support tools through rapid situated evaluation. So next, I want to pivot away from color and touch on a different aspect of my research, which is how do we leverage cognitive processing in vis visualization design? So we have a wide range of projects in this area, ranging from looking at behavior and decision making to the point I want to talk about today, which is actually understanding cognitive accessibility. So data is being used to justify a wide range of policies and decisions. But who are we leaving out in our current data communication practices? This project aims to understand barriers in existing practice for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities and to develop principles for overcoming these barriers. So a lot of the work that I'm going to talk about is still ongoing, but I wanted to spend more time talking about the work in this space that has been published. So this work is motivated in large part by a collaboration with the Coleman Institute for Intellectual and Developmental Disabilities. They're very interested in self-advocacy. That is, how can people with disabilities have more agency in the policies that affect them? Policymaking is increasing by data. We've seen that, especially in light of all of the recent data that's come out in the epidemiological space. But in conversations with psychiatrists, clinicians, and care partners, current tools for analytics simply are not working for people with intellectual and developmental disability. And we wanted to understand why and how we could do better. Part of understanding why is challenging the fundamental assumption in visualization that everyone processes visual information in the same way. People with IDD have differences that emerge in the visual information processing components of the human cognitive system. So we turn to education and psychology to try to understand where our current assumptions might be falling short. And in ongoing work, we're taking more of a generative approach, trying to understand um, how, what kinds of representations are intuitive for people with IDD using more of a participatory design approach. Since this work is ongoing, I wanna focus on the first thread that is what these practices are or aren't working for people with IDD. 
And I want to take a step back to explain what I mean by IDD. So IDD, or intellectual and developmental disability, is characterized by limitations in social, conceptual, or practical skills, and it affects over 200 million people worldwide. These disabilities often result in differences in memory, attention, visual comprehension, or math comprehension, and as you might imagine, all of these are critical skills for people trying to work with data visualizations. In practice, these limitations mean that the sheer complexity of existing tools, including complex multi-view designs, challenges in interaction, and building insights over time that traditional tools like Tableau and Power BI are designed to support, end up being prohibitively challenging. In interviews with psychiatrists and through our own observations from the educational literature, we actually devised a few specific interventions that might challenge existing VIS guidelines but have the potential to enhance accessibility. The first of these is probing just what charts will work. Uh, so in this, we tend to have this concept of chart choosers or, recommend or recommender systems that choose the single best viz for a given task or a given type of statistic we wanna interrogate. However, we know from interviews that pie charts, for example, are totally inaccessible. And we wanted to explore as how well different charts might support given tasks. And if this differs from our conventional practices and our conventional chart choosers and visualization. We also wanted to explore the idea of discretization. So this suggests that continuous representations like lines and bars are simple, clean, and optimal. However, research in mathematical processing for children with intellectual disabilities runs contrary to this. While kids' abilities to generalize abstract quantities is limited, studies show that the approximate number system, which is essentially the ability to roughly interpret how many objects are present in a scene for people with IDD, may be comparably efficient to traditional populations, meaning that discretization may actually be quite beneficial. And in visualization, using semantic information like we see here is actually kind of a big no-no. It adds visual complexity with questionable benefit. However, research in education shows semantic pictograms actually significantly enhance visual, visual reasoning for children with Down syndrome. And we wanted to explore if different methods for visual semantics might have a similar effect in data representation. So to try to probe a lot of these questions, we designed a mixed method study exploring the effects of chart type, discretization, and visual semantics with 34 participants with and without IDD, looking at proportion and time series data in a series of fiscal self-advocacy questions. We collected data about objective performance across different tasks, as well as subjective data about preference and usability. I'll leave details about the methods, the Q&A or the paper, but the TLDR is that we found traditional VIS guidelines make data inaccessible. So we were able to generate four key design guidelines for enhancing data accessibility. Uh, the first of these is resonates pretty well with what we had heard from practitioners, that we just want to avoid pie charts. People with IDD perform significantly worse than chance using pies, whereas performance with stack bar charts or tree maps was comparable to our non-IDD participants. And while we found mixed effects on the use of semantics, using familiar metaphors sparingly, such as just this very clean iconography, actually greatly increased data comprehension. We found in our subjective feedback that these effects were directly related to this idea of comprehension. People saw the semantics, the meaning of the data when they looked at the charts, and it made it easier to try to make sense of the information that they were processing. People with IDD also relied more heavily on visual metaphors like bars mimicking staircases or trees, tree maps mimicking pieces of paper as part of their visual reasoning processes. We also found that semantics could be prohibitive. Overly complex representations perform poorly in both objectively and subjectively. The true takeaway is people just felt overwhelmed and it took significantly more time to try to complete the task when representations were more complex. Finally, discretization also helped some. Uh, we found that when discrete marks were axis aligned, like we see here in this bar chart, performance and preference were both high. However, when they were not axis aligned, as in the pie chart here on the right, people found themselves resorting to counting strategies, leading to longer time on task and lower overall preference. 
So we're actively working on this problem as there's still so much to understand and do to make this work actionable. And one of the projects that we're gearing up to run is a participatory design workshop that will explore how people with IDD naturally tackle simple data communication problems related to everyday life. We're also working with the Coleman Institute to explore how we might automatically adapt visualizations to become more accessible. And my student Kiki Wu has been working with them to change their products like their chart builder to use more accessible practices. So for the final thread that I wanna walk you through today, I'm actually gonna talk a little bit about how we can move data off the monitor and into the real world using augmented reality to allow people to explore data within the context that data describes, leading hopefully to more timely and actionable analysis. And the driving problem behind this work is data use in field research and emergency response. So in these scenarios, data is typically collected in the field with scientists and responders carefully assessing field sites in small teams. At the end of the day, or even at the end of the operation, this data is brought back to the command center for analysis using traditional analytics tools. So in interviews with a range of experts in these fields, we found that it was almost universal practice, but that this process introduced some problematic divides. For example, it removed analysis from the times and places where people could actually do something with the data. For example, one scientist described flying a large fixed wing drone at a remote site in Greenland, um, running a month long survey and returning home only to realize that a good chunk of their data simply didn't record. So this ends up being a million dollar mistake. When we talked to analysts, they noticed that analyzing data out of context meant that people in the field were actually operating on stale data. And in the emergency response scenarios, this could create potentially life-threatening uh, situations, especially when we're talking about things like search and rescue or wildland fire, where field sites might be dynamically changing. We also found that this paradigm meant that most analysts didn't have any access to the context that the data described. And if they found errors or key information in their data, they simply weren't in a position to act on those observations uh, because they weren't out in the field. They were back in the operations center. So in this line of work, we're looking to understand how we might design immersive analytics tools that leverage non-traditional displays to embed the analysts within the data to overcome these temporal and spatial gaps in analysis. In other words, how can we shift from seeing data as a thing that lives in a spreadsheet to one part of a larger, often dynamic space where data is informed by situated context and can immediately inform action and decision? So my work in this space predominantly approaches this challenge from two sides, bottom up through design and perception experiments and top down through application. On the design side, we're thinking about how do we create visualizations that seamlessly blend the real and virtual worlds? And we're specifically using an empirical approach to understand how the ways we visualize data in augmented reality shift our perceptions of that data, both in terms of its relation to the real world and its ability to effectively convey critical statistics. On the application side, we're taking more of a problem-driven approach to understand how visualizations can leverage the capabilities of immersive devices for people to use data more effectively. For example, in collaboration with NREL, we explored how experiential data storytelling and augmented reality could help communicate the use and benefits of hydrogen fueling more effectively than traditional 2D media like a slideshow. So part of the challenge of designing such systems and why we lack guidelines for effectively visualizing data in AR is that visualization has a long love-hate relationship with 3D. We know that on 2D monitors, 3D visualizations can cause a lot of problems. For example, 3D pie charts like this distort perceived percentages. It can be really tricky to try to resolve the individual dots in 3D scatter plots or heights in 3D bar charts. And we even see these tools adding labels to try and simplify this task. Well, not using 3D is conventional design wisdom for traditional bids, but it's also possible that stereoscopic viewing in AR and VR may actually reopen this channel for visualization. And I see we've got a hand up if you wanna go ahead and jump in. Um, yeah, I wasn't sure when to interrupt or not, but I guess I figured I'd... So I see uh, some of them uh, had a lot of different hypotheses tests and kind of these very interesting ways of trying to think about the the, yeah. the, the process. So it, it seems almost data this seems to be like a bundle of decisions a lot of the time that, yes. that seems to kind of almost like meld together. And I was wondering if you could uh, uh, 
comment a little bit about how do you see of what exactly is being falsified when you do some kind of hypothesis test, uh, particularly on the last section and in here, I think even more so. So when you're trying to compare these these different slides and, and how you exactly attribute these comparisons back to a given hypothesis. So for example, you think you had some donuts and then the then that was the line, but then it seems like, you know, oh, but this one has an axis, the other one doesn't have an axis and yeah. the different ways and like what exactly are you, yeah, thank you. Yeah, so I mean, in our work, we try to sample along a, a continuum, and right, we can think of this con continuum as being from reductionist evaluation to holistic evaluation. So, in the more holistic side, we're trying to get to that point of ecological validity, where the kinds of things we're assessing reflect what people are doing in practice and the environments they're viewing things in in practice. So, for example, in the last study with intellectual and developmental disability, we're really thinking about this idea of how do people interpret this kind of physical data in common representations. So we use statistical tasks to collect the objective data, but we also use subjective measures to have people walk us through. What are they seeing? Why do they prefer it? What makes sense? What doesn't? What's easy? What's hard? Um, so that's how we're trying to get at the more holistic evaluation. And there are even examples, which I don't have time to talk about today, where the way we evaluate something is we build something, put it out in the wild, and see what knowledge people get and what findings they generate. So that's that kind of far side of holistic evaluation. There's also the very reductionist side, which is where we want to try to understand specific aspects of this to try to make very low level design guidance. And so a lot of what I'm going to get to here in a minute with this study is focusing on that. For example, we want to understand what are the affordances of immersive analytics? What happens when I take data off the screen and put it in a headset? put it in AR, put it in VR, and how my designs need to change. And a lot of these kinds of studies often occur very early in the design process because they're the kinds of things that just are providing our fundamental mappings and are ensuring that the way data is represented actually reflects the differences that truly exist in our data. So we're looking at, in that case, measuring very controlled differences in our representation and trying to model how the small variations in those differences translate to differences in interpretation. So I think to, to do effective visualization, to generate effective guidelines, we really need samples all along that continuum from the low level concrete quantitative decisions, to the high level, more subjective, more qualitative notions of how do these low level pieces all come together and interact in interesting ways to try to help us understand what makes that visualization tick. Awesome, and that's actually a great segue into um, this next experiment, unless you have a quick follow on there. Cool. Yeah, very. Oh, I think you might be muted. So, so very quickly, so, so my understanding then is you would merge both data sets at some point and uh, try to think about a, kind of a, a quality based approach as well as concrete guidance on those different qualities in some sense. So I changed colors from red to blue and I people said that red the change from red to blue is not very good. Yeah, and the basic idea is that by having all this data, we're actually empowering designers to do that merging and to make the trade-offs in their specific scenarios and in the specific context they're working in. Um, I'm not convinced that we can do that at this point automatically. I don't think we can totally replace the human intuition in design, but that's a whole philosophical argument for later. Cool. Cool. So the the a great point following up on this, though, is that not using 3D is conventional design wisdom for traditional viz, and some of the leading figures in the field of immersive analytics tend to think that we generally want to follow the same kinds of rules that we see in traditional viz and in AR and VR, that these kinds of 3D stereoscopic immersive displays may not actually fundamentally change, for example, the fact that 3D isn't always very good. Um, so some of these guidelines that you see here may feel a little bit counterintuitive given the affordances of immersive devices, such as the idea that 3D perspective doesn't help or that 3D nav is hard to do when, we're in, at, when we do it every day in the real world. And we wanted to test how these ideas hold up in practice, again, getting to that idea of the kind of low-level design specification. So we investigated what happens when we ask people to use the same visualization on a desktop versus in VR versus in AR. 
And so in the study, people use 2D and 3D visualizations and coding data using a range of visual channels, such as color and size, to estimate a series of different statistics. And we compared how quickly and accurately people completed these tasks, as well as how much they interacted with the data. And while I can chat about specific results online, the takeaway here is that the same visualizations perform differently on the desktop AR and VR conditions. In other words, this design is not one size fits all displays, but rather we need different guidance depending on the kinds of displays we're using. So to highlight a few of our findings, on a 2D monitor, it's really hard to resolve whether a 3D scatter point or bar is either smaller or further away from a larger point. However, showing the same scatter plot in AR or VR allowed people to more readily disentangle size and depth, potentially reopening this dimension. We saw an opposing effect for color. People struggled to interpret color-coded data in AR, and we can see an example of this here. Putting the points of our darker objects makes points appear lighter and vice versa, so we kind of get this muting effect of our color choices. This is related to a phenomenon known as simultaneous contrast. And while AR degraded color interpretation, we actually found that it increased engagement. People walked around and interacted with data significantly more in AR than either the desktop or VR, and subjectively noted that they were actually more comfortable interacting with data in AR. Still a ton more to unpack here, but this offers interesting questions for interaction design and immersive analytics. And the larger takeaway from the study is that we need new guidelines and practices for designing effective data visualizations using emerging technologies. We explored some of these possible designs in FieldView, which is a prototype toolkit for field-based analytics. So building on a series of interviews with scientists and emergency responders, we developed a multi-device application to support field data collection analysis practices. So our solution couples a mobile application for data collection, overview analysis, with detailed contextualized visualizations in AR. And the workflow for this tool starts with our data collection app, where field analysts can input a variety of information that's automatically geotagged, the information is cached and when connected, synced with cloud data store or local network, where members of a field team can access a common data store. Anal analysts then pull down this data and view summary overview visualizations on mobile devices or project ge geotag data into the real world to explore this data in a situated context. So we released FieldView as an open source toolkit, including a prototype mobile overview and immersive detail visualizations for three common scenarios noted in our discussions with analysts. Coordinating data collection activities over a local team, monitoring data quality during field collection, and accessing data collected by autonomous sensors, such as overhead drones. To give you just a very quick overview of how these visualizations work, here you see a scatter plot or a stratified grid on a field site. A team member can identify regions of uncollected data, which are shown here in these big blue squares. And these areas are replaced by situated color-coded scatter plot values when data is provided. Analysts can then go ahead and move into the missing areas to collect new data, and you'll see the overlay disappears when the analyst is within the missing region to avoid occluding field of view. So this next example shows how we might use the field view interface to connect with aerial imagery that's collected by a drone. The scatter plot points indicate available imagery with color corresponding to temperature measures collected by a drone sensor. We can click on the points to show the overhead data with the images remaining just outside of the central field of view to preserve the analyst's abilities to maintain awareness of the environment. The points in the periphery indicate data outside the user's primary view with their size and position queuing to distance and orientation relative to the user. So the basic idea here is that we're trying to use this overhead imagery to provide immediate context for current operations and to monitor autonomous data collection operations in real time while still maintaining overall awareness and the responder's ability to operate within their local environment. Everything here is still quite preliminary, but our work in this space illuminated a number of interesting questions at the intersection of robotics and data analytics for emergency response operations that myself and my collaborators are currently exploring. Um, I'm also in the preliminary phase of exploring how we can design visualizations that intelligently adapt to the user's surroundings to maximize information gain while minimizing interference with the environment. For example, we're looking at how we can use information about lighting and scene composition to make better color choices, or how we might adapt the complexity of a viz based on movement in the local environments. So part of addressing these questions is also understanding how the context provided by situated viz can actually aid data comprehension and decision making, and in turn, how designs might best take advantage of such games. So in the interest of time, I'm just gonna sum up really quickly here. We've looked at three threads of research to demonstrate the processes I use to create effective visualization systems for data exploration. 
starting with this idea of how do we use color more effectively and moving into how this might mediate human machine teaming with large data sets in a in mixed initiative anal or sorry in uh, in uh, cognitive accessibility and finally exploring how AR can reduce potential spatial and temporal gaps in analysis for applications like environmental science and emergency response. And this represents a lot of the work that we've done to date. We have lots of other fun work that's going on between looking at using um, hardware and wearables to promote data science literacy, looking at collaborative human machine teaming, looking at the interface of robotics and viz, and also looking at how we might use making and paper craft to build um, informal activities for early childhood data literacy. Uh, if folks are interested in connecting about any of these projects, please do reach out. For the sake of time, I think I'm just going to cut here to the end and thank my collaborators. Thank you all for having me today. Thank you for you know listening and also take any questions that you all might have. I'm looking forward to the discussion. Hi, uh, thanks so much for, for a great talk. Um, I had a follow-up question regarding kind of AR and color. So you talked about your work uh, studying color and um, the importance of selection, selecting that color and also your work in, in understanding the challenges that AR poses in selecting color given the background. And you briefly mentioned kind of looking at lighting and scene composition to, to select colors appropriately. And I was wondering if you can talk a little bit more about uh, what makes color important in AR and uh, is there reasons for maybe exploring other visual attributes like motion or things that may uh, kind of not have the same issues in AR? Uh, and if not, what? Uh, how, how can we kind of look at um, uh, using perception to kind of correct some of those issues with color and different backgrounds? Yeah, a series of great questions. There's a ton to unpack there. Um, I would say, you know, one of the things I didn't have time to talk about in that study is we actually generated a ranking of what visualization techniques or what visual channels work best for which modalities. And this is where, you know, color was not as good in AR as other modalities. So if we think about trying to privilege other like position or size that might be more precise, this understanding where color sits with respect to all of this allows us to understand when do we actually need to take on that challenge of working with color. Um, how we do it is gonna be a little more complicated. Color tends to be really, really good for high level kinds of statistics when I need to do things like estimating averages or also for drawing attention very, very quickly, right? If I see a red point in a field of blue points, I'm gonna look right at it. And so I think those are the situations where we need to think about are there ways of making color better? Or in AR, do there happen to be better ways of achieving the same kinds of tasks? And I think there's a lot of open-ended questions that um, I'm looking forward to seeing where things go because I think there's lots and lots of cool stuff that could come out of that. Thank you so much. Great talk. Thank you. Great. I have a question. Thanks so much for this really exciting talk. And I think kind of following up on the question, um, you know, you talked a little bit about uh, in, in terms of AR, VR, and then uh, kind of a desktop side of things. It seems like there's a lot to unpack there in terms of both like different techniques for interactive perception and the different ways in which a person can interact with it. But then also on the low level perceptual side, and you know, there it seems like a big difference is in terms of these depth cues. And you know, there are lots of different, you know, cues that we use for depth. And I'm wondering, you know, how much of this is connected to the specific display technology that we have versus inherent in, you know, AR, VR, et cetera. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a great question. In that study, we were trying to minimize the variation. So we actually were using either pass-through with the um, HTC Vive and the, the Z Mini, or we were using just the HTC uh, Vive. So we were trying to really minimize the amount of device variation, but that's really going to be a thing, especially when you start to think about things like interaction plus perception plus field of view. If I'm only seeing a small portion of the display and I'm losing all the information that's coming in the periphery, how is that changing my decision making? How is that changing how I choose to move and interact in the space? 
So I think there are a lot of parameters of the display technologies and display hard hardware and the ways that changes the, how we might intuitively interact with the, the representations that are still to be explored and are really critical when we think about how do we put these, these ideas into actionable context. And there's even the broader point that we ran into that I uh, glossed over because it's a really hard hardware challenge, which is what happens when we take these technologies outside You'll notice all of our videos were on very cloudy days. It's because on bright and sunny days, you can't see anything in the headsets. So this is another challenge that, that pertains to displays and perception and all of the rich environmental contexts that come into play once you actually start to put these things out into practice. So I think that this is a long way of saying we still need a lot more work because all of these different factors are definitely come to get, going to come together and influence efficacy and influence design. Can I ask a question? Go for it. Yep. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Thank you for your talk. Um, so you mentioned uh, the, the study, like comparing the AR, VR, and the traditional 2D, like 2D analytics. But do you have any suggestions on like uh, when to do the like immersive and when to do 2D? Because some people might argue like whether it's necessary to do AR, VR, especially given that like, 2D might be more accessible, like the smartphones, laptops, are more like more often used than the AR VR has said. Yeah, so um, it's interesting you bring this up. So we discussed this, there is a, a paper that came out at CHI last year on grand challenges for immersive analytics, where this was a huge point for us is figuring out what situations does it make sense to use immersive spaces versus when does it make sense to use traditional, you know, desktop based analytics. And my argument would be that there are two situations that really come to mind. Um, this is just, just my own opinion from my own experiences. This is not something that's yet backed by data. But there are two situations in particular where this kind of immersive space can make a lot of sense. Um, one of these is when you're situating data, when having the context of the physical environment is actually going to affect the kinds of decisions that you need to make. So if I am looking at a burning structure and then I see my scatter plot about the current heat map distribution or heat temperature distributions in the local region, that's going to give me a whole lot more information. It's going to be a whole lot more actionable. Um, the same, it comes into play when you're starting to think about these kinds of um, basically putting information in the space where we need to be able to act, right? I can bring around my phone with me, but anytime I'm doing analytics on a phone, right? This is why we don't do texting and driving. You have divided attention. I can pay full attention to my phone. I can pay full attention to what I'm doing and I'm moving my attention back and forth between devices. So I would say the second scenario is in those cases where divided attention is less than ideal. Um, so those are more cases where having that situated nature might be really helpful. And a lot of this might come down to things like ambient situational awareness that's promoted by always having that display available to you, but maybe you're not always fully attending to the display. And if you need full attention, you can bring that data back out into the environment. So those would be the two cases that I would posit that this kind of situatedness is actually beneficial beyond what we have on a 2D display. There are interesting questions about interactive affordances, about the role of immersion, about how immersion and you know, physical reconstruction in space might actually influence spatial comprehension. But I don't think we have enough in the immersive analytics space yet to say whether those benefits outweigh the trade-offs of moving into this new modality. Yeah, thank you. Oh, it's a good question. This is all getting to stuff that I think we as a field still need to figure out. <laughs> this is great. All right. Well, if there aren't any other questions, then let's thank Danielle for that really exciting talk. And yeah, thanks so much. <laughs>